welcome everybody um, to our solar permitting webinar slash workshop. My name is Merit Koch. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the energy and sustainability planner for Ramsey County. And I'm very happy that you're here today, either on the phone, on the computer, or in the room. We have, um, how many people do we have on the computer? We have about 10 folks, so probably 30, well, better than 30 total. And my job really is to just do some quick housekeeping so that we can get right into it. Um, we have restrooms near where you came in, the front door, refreshments on the back table. Uh, we will have a break after Bill Brooks's presentation. And if there's anything you need, you can either ask myself or Cameron, who's in the back of the room. And um, that's about it for our housekeeping. Oh, we do have composting. So if you have a bite of cookie and decide you don't want it, or you have orange peels, they go in the composting bin. Um, so thank you for that. And there are recycling bins and a trash bin in the back of the room as well. So I would like to introduce Commissioner Victoria Reinhardt from Ramsey County. Um, I thought I was gonna be able to memorize all the different achievements she has and that sort of thing, but I just decided, no, that's, that's too long. So I'm, I'm just gonna go for it with the reading. So Victoria uh, began her public life many years ago as president of the local um, parent-teacher organization in her community. And over the years, she's gone on to be a real coalition builder. She's um, been working with organizations as diverse as the Recycling Association of Minnesota, which is where I first met you, and to, to organizations like the Ramsey County Violence-Free Families Initiative. Since being elected to Ramsey County, uh, to the Ramsey County Board, she's been working on regional issues like transportation, waste management, housing, and technology integration. And she's testified at the Minnesota legislature as well as in Congress about how local governments can work together, which is one of the reasons we're here today, to share best practices and learn from each other. Commissioner Reinhardt's leadership has made Minnesota a leader in product stewardship. That's something a lot of people may not know. And also keeping toxins out of our waste stream. She currently serves as chairperson of the Ramsey Washington Recycling and Energy Board, and she's the vice president of the National Association of Counties, Environment, Energy, and Land Use Steering Committee. She's also a member of the Minnesota Clean Water Advocacy Advisory Council and the Local Government Advisory Committee for the US EPA. In May of 2007, Commissioner Reinhardt received her doctorate in public administration from Hamlin University. She received both her undergraduate and her master's degree degrees from Metro State University. So please um, help me give Commissioner Reinhardt a warm welcome. Good afternoon. I'm always uh, curious as to what um, my assistant has put down as far as my biography. You covered it very well. <laughs> So I am really pleased to be here today and to welcome you all, those in the room and those that are, are listening and watching. Um, really what we're talking about today, today is a path to solar energy. And Ramsey County is uh, totally committed to promoting renewable energy development and reducing greenhouse gas emissions within its own operations and beyond. We have so solar thermal panels, photo photovoltaic panels, and we participate in a lot of uh, community solar projects. And with all of that, I mean, it, it's really clear that we need to grow even further within just not our own operations, but also in housing, businesses, municipal, and transportation sectors across the county as a whole. And transportation is becoming more and more, um, hopefully, will continue to grow as well. And incorporating solar into that, to me, is incredibly important. It has the power to or the potential to power our local economy beyond the emissions-free electricity. Planning, design, installation, marketing, maintenance, and repair of our new solar panel grid will expand training and development employment and employment opportunities for our communities. So it's also a job builder. In 2015, Ramsey County, along with Hennepin County, the city of Minneapolis, and the Metropolitan Council, and I know we have people here from 
um, all of those, and the Metro CERTS teams developed the Governmental Solar Garden Subscriber Collaborative. And really what that is all about is getting people together, doing the same work that we would have to do individually and reducing staff time so that we can work together and get a better product in the end as well. The, um, and so, and that is participating in then, as you could tell, Hennepin County, Ramsey County and, and so forth. Um, we really are looking at this as a region wide thing. In 2017, Ramsey County set energy reduction goals of 25% by 2020 and 30% by 2025, and that's over the 2008 baseline. At the same time, the county board adopted carbon reduction goals aligned with the state of Minnesota's goals, which are 30% for greenhouse gas emissions reduction by 2025 and 80% gas emissions, greenhouse gas emissions reduction by 2050. And again, that's over the 2008 baseline here. In 2017, and this is the most exciting part for me today anyhow, uh, the county applied for SoulSmart designation and was accepted into the program. And today I'm happy to announce that we have been awarded the SoulSmart Silver designation. And that is primarily due to the quality and the ease of use of our web portal. So I really wanna thank Mary Takash and Christy Saxvig um, for all the time they put into that. And um, I think it's gonna be, I'm shooting for the end of the year to be able to brag about a gold designation. Now, the county signed on to SolSmart Sol because of its desire to inc incorporate more solar energy into its energy mix and to make it easier for all of our communities and citizens to add solar to their energy mix as well. When we were accepted into the SolSmart program, we were granted a technical advisor, and that is incredibly important because it's a very tangible benefit, and it provided financial analysis for the county's uh, we have two solar projects in our parks department, and they also assisted staff as they began to frame up a countywide solar plan that will be completed later this year. So again, a very tangible benefit of the Soul Smart program. In 2019, with the technical assistance from the program, the county will develop both renewable energy and solar energy goals and a plan to achieve those goals. Ramsey County will continue to monitor the progress towards its next energy use and carbon reduction goals with clear performance measures. And as anybody who works for Ramsey County knows, clear performance measures are the baseline of everything we do because you need to know how you're doing in order to make improvements and report and figure out what is the best way to move forward. Um, and we do that for every department in Ramsey County. As a Soul Smart member, Ramsey County encourages all communities to join the Green Step Cities program, to become certified under the National Soul Smart program, and to use the Metropolitan Council's solar calculations as a planning and decision making tool. It is very valuable and it helps with land use uh, development and the areas that would be suitable and determining the areas that would be suitable for solar energy production. Again, they provide technical assistance, SolSmart does, and that helps build staff capacity to grow the county's solar program and will help Ramsey County in developing a pathway to setting and reaching its solar energy goals. In 2019, right now, Ramsey County is conducting a structural analysis for rooftop solar for each of its high potential buildings as part of its efforts to integrate on-site solar into its energy mix. We still have a long way to go, but I am confident I know we will get there. I want to thank Cameron Bailey, who serves as the county's technical uh, advisor through the Met Council, and both David Golombeski from the Solar Foundation and Bill Brooks, you'll be hearing from them. Bill is an industry expert in solar permitting and inspections, um, and they will be talking about their expertise today. And I'd also like to thank Jenna Green from the Great Plains Institute for her assistance in making today's program possible. Now, I would like to welcome David Golombeski, and I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, to say a few words. Thank you. All right. Thanks everyone for, for being here. I just want to give a brief introduction about SoulSmart and talk about some of the accomplishments uh, from Minnesota that we've seen so far. 
So SoulSmart is a national designation and technical assistance program for local governments that are uh, interested in being solar ready. And so uh, we like to break out the program describe it in two, two ways. So earlier today, we were just uh, awarding many local governments. Um, you go, yeah, so we were just awarding uh, many local governments uh, some plaques for their uh, solar achievements and uh, for being solar ready. And we do that at a bronze, silver, and gold level. And the other part of that is for communities that are interested in becoming solar ready, we provide no cost technical assistance by uh, national solar experts uh, in the field. So like today, we have uh, a preeminent uh, expert on solar permitting, uh, Bill Brooks here for a, for a great uh, training seminar. Uh, so, you know, program started in about mid uh, 2016 and we have designated over 250 cities, towns, and, uh, and counties throughout the United States. Uh, and in Minnesota, actually, with the designation of uh, Ramsey County, we have uh, 20 designees. And within the Minnesota St. Paul region, we have 14. Um, and something that I'm, we're really excited is about, there's about 32 additional local governments in Minnesota that are on the path of designation. Uh, and so, you know, what that means is that these local governments are making it faster, easier, and more affordable for their residents uh, and businesses to go solar. And so when you have a, a region like the Minnesota-St. Minnesota Paul region all come together and all becoming solar ready, uh, you know, it means that, you know, costs to go solar are lower. I can highlight uh, one study from the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory from 2015, and it found that uh, differences in local permitting processes uh, can raise the cost uh, of solar per watt by 18 cents. So for a typical five kilowatt system, that can be an increase of about $900. So when you see leadership from the local level, it can make a big difference for a resident to go solar. And, you know, uh, we've just, just been talking about a lot of leadership from Minnesota, you know, the 20 local governments who have been leaders on solar. Uh, according to the Solar Foundation, uh, who does this, the National Solar Job Census, uh, the Minnesota St. Paul region is ranked fifth in the nation in uh, solar jobs growth. And I think that can definitely be attributed to the leadership, you know, at the local level. Uh, and so I'd like to talk about a few, you know, highlight a couple good achievements from Minnesota. Um, I know uh, Edina uh, recently uh, put together a, or developed a city-owned community solar array atop their uh, public works building. And that is uh, leased or subscribed by residents within, within that city uh, area. And that's very, very unique. I think it's one of the first of its kind. Uh, Jordan, Minnesota, like many other cities and towns in Minnesota, developed a, a solar permitting application. So rather than having a, a building permit and an electrical permit, they have one specifically for solar. So it's, you know, it's very simple and easy uh, for installers and developers to, to you know, put solar on, on roofs. Uh, St. Paul, like many other communities, developed a solar permitting checklist. Uh, so it lists out uh, exactly the requirements to uh, install on the roof, um, what, you know, what exactly you need, and again, to really simplify it and to make it, uh, you know, faster to install. And thus lowering costs for the installer uh, and passing that down to uh, the resident. Um, as Shorewood, as another example, uh, they uh, developed a uh, solar uh, or a, an energy action plan. Um, so, I mean, you know, there's so many more that I could list, uh, but, you know, it's been, it's been really exciting and, and great to see all the leadership uh, um, from local governments uh, to advance solar. And uh, just want to say, uh, to end it, just to congratulate the you know, 20 local governments have been designated 
and uh, just excited about these other 30 plus local governments that are on the path to designation. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Um, so we'll just move right into Bill Brooks, and I think he will do his own introduction and take us through a lot of great information today. So thank you. There we go. Now I'm unmuted. How is the audio now? You can hear? Okay. Alrighty, well, uh, please let me know if there's something not working correctly. I'm uh, trying to do this through the phone so it's a little bit clearer and not dependent on the internet and uh, we'll hope that the internet hangs in there for us today. Um, lovely spring day up in Minnesota. I, I understand it's raining today, uh, but uh, probably the snow is all but gone with the rain, hopefully. And um, on to springtime. So today uh, we're going to be talking about uh, permitting guidelines. Some of you may have been uh, participated in uh, previous trainings that I've done in the area. Uh, I actually have done a few trainings in the Minneapolis-St. Paul region, and uh, uh, many of you may have or some of you may have participated. Hopefully, most of you have not. Uh, so this will be new information. Although we're continuing to improve these materials all the time, and we're excited about launching a new website, which uh, should be live certainly before the end of the month. We're nearly there, just a few little final edits to the website, and uh, we'll have all this information available on the website. We'll also have this information available through electronically through email uh, for everyone. And we also want to uh, make sure that, that everyone has an opportunity to ask questions in this type of a format. It may be easier. Uh, we're gonna probably hold the questions till the end for most things, but um, I'm happy if, if someone would like to interject in the middle of this, uh, we can stop and talk about some things as well. So um, for the next 45 minutes or so, I'm gonna be talking about the permitting guidelines and uh, let's get right to it. Let's make sure that the materials are working correctly. All right. Um, all right, how is this? Let's see, from beginning. Okay, now it's working. Don't ask me why. Um, so this is just to give you an idea of where the soul smart communities are throughout the United States. And this is actually a little bit dated, but uh, we can see that um, Minnesota in particular has quite a few soul smart communities, as was just mentioned. Uh, the community there has uh, just achieved their silver status. So that's great news. Uh, a lot of good things going on in Minnesota and uh, like to see what, what's going on there and certainly been happy to help uh, several communities there and continue to help them as they work on their uh, permitting processes and inspection processes. <clears throat> so just to give everyone a, a basic idea of what we're dealing with here in case you haven't, uh, been familiar with this, this set of guidelines uh, for local jurisdictions and contractors. They can permit simple PV systems um, where basic review is necessary. This is making sure that the majority of uh, residential and, and possibly small commercial systems will comply with these simple criteria that address the requirements for the building electrical and fire codes. So the way that uh, we set up these guidelines, uh, basically we have eligibility for these uh, various aspects for structural and electrical. And the eligibility is uh, defined by the size of the system 
electrical and structural uh, issues and fire safety issues. And uh, we have a separate structural review and an electrical review, and we're going to go through those in some detail. We're probably going to spend a lot more time on the structural side of things, uh, certainly in the Minneapolis area and, and um, in that region, Minnesota. Uh, snow, snow loads are a big concern, and so we want to make sure that everyone understands that those things have been addressed carefully in these guidelines, as well as the electrical issues that are very important as well. Uh, so if we look at what the current laws are, uh, these guidelines that were put, put together are not intended to create new requirements. These are basically a set of guidelines that meet the requirements. Um, and so uh, sometimes when somebody sees something new, they go, oh, well, this is a whole bunch of new code or whatever, and that's not the intention here at all. The intention is that we're putting together a set of guidelines that if you meet these guidelines, you're clearly compliant with the National Electrical Code, uh, the Residential Code, if that's the appropriate uh, document. In some cases, the Building Code may be uh, the, the appropriate document. However, these guidelines were primarily focused on one and two, two family homes, which is Residential Code uh, is, is meant to address, and buildings of, of like construction. International Fire Code is actually addressed in the Residential Code. Things like fire setbacks and things like that are actually found in the residential code essentially copied from the fire code. The building codes in general are based upon uh, ASCE 7, which is the American Society of Civil Engineers document for minimum building load. Um, document uh, was updated in 2016. And um, actually the interesting thing is that the residential code does not use the 2016 version. It actually uses the 2010 version. And so the guidelines that we're focusing on are focused on the 2010 version of ASCE 7 because that's the uh, current version that's being used in both the uh, 2015 and the 2018 residential code. Okay, uh, so what is the required information for a permit? Well, uh, there's four items that we're going to talk about. One is basic information that's true of almost every construction project. There needs to be information about the scope of the project, where it is, who's doing it, all those kinds of things that are just commonplace uh, parts of pulling a permit, the logistics, if you will. The second item would be a, a site plan. Uh, now, a lot of folks might get into really detailed concerns about a plot plan and things like that, and that's where we're not necessarily referring to that. If somebody has those uh, details, that's great, but we're looking for something that basically provides information on where the equipment is going, uh, calling out possibly setbacks from uh, neighboring properties if that's necessary, or neighboring or the edges of roofs for fire setback purposes, th those types of things, where equipment is located. That, those are the main things that we're trying to focus on, and we can also use that same site plan to talk about uh, where the attachments are going to be made to the roof. And so we'll go into some detail. We'll show you some, some uh, sample plans uh, that show where the attachments are going to be made on the trusses and things like that. And so that's the, uh, when we're talking about fire setbacks and things like that, uh, this is where we would also address those, as I said. Uh, the electrical requirements would be the third item. And um, the way we do that is through a set of electrical worksheets. Now, we do have some calculations that have to be performed on um, because of the, the fact that photovoltaic systems, as the, as the temperature outside goes down, which uh, Minnesota is very well known for, uh, the temperature going down, then the voltage goes up. And so we need to make sure that uh, the equipment that we're uh, installing is not exposed to over voltages, and therefore uh, we have a few simple calculations that are quite a bit simpler than the 1040 form, as many of you were uh, working with in the last week or so. Um, so, and then last item is specification sheets and installation manuals. So we need provide information, the contractor, and all this information we're talking about is gonna be provided for the, by the installer to the jurisdiction. And so we're looking for information, specification sheets, installation manuals, and the like. 
uh, that talk about the major system components, such as the PV modules, any DC optimizers, controllers, things like that, uh, converters, and mounting equipment. All right, so let's get into some of the details here. Um, purposes of this whole process, it's already been uh, talked about a little bit in the introductory remarks, uh, but we're trying to simplify and consolidate structural, electrical, and fire review uh, so that one person could actually perform those functions. Uh, eliminate the need for detailed engineering studies that can create delays, unnecessary delays. And so um, th that's why we put some very severe uh, limitations on what can pass through this process, but we believe that probably 80% or more of all PV systems actually will comply with these uh, rules that we set forth here. Uh, but if somebody wants to put in something that doesn't meet these rules, then the normal uh, process is available, and that may include engineering studies. The intent of this is not to circumvent engineering. I'm an engineer. I'm, I'm not there to try to take people out of the engineering process by any means. It's just that when we're dealing with one and two family homes, we've literally done about a million and a half of these things in the United States alone. Uh, and there's, there are many, many uh, things that we can do to simplify that process, make it part of normal construction, and not require engineering studies. Um, and then occasionally, of course, the, that there is a need for that. Um, so uh, the last item is on this uh, slide is talking about the similarities uh, in projects. And so we want to develop requirements that are based on the engineering principles, but are com clearly compliant with the electrical building fire codes. So we kind of create, I, what I've come to describe as a box. And so by, by the box, I mean, this is a compliance box that says that uh, if your project isn't inside this box or set of parameters, thresholds, if you will, um, then you've got two choices, get it in the box, and then you can be treated in a simplified permitting path or get in line with everyone else and um, uh, we have a normal construction process that would comply, would, would apply in that case. Um, I know a lot of folks that uh, are doing solar systems feel like they're saving the world. I certainly feel like I'm saving the world with what I do in the solar industry, but the fact of the matter is we have a construction industry, we have a construction process, this process is intended to give a certain level of favoritism towards something that's simple and straightforward. Um, by doing that, that's kind of a carrot to the contractor and the owner that's saying, hey, listen, if you can do this, great, and we'll reward you with, um, with better, maybe what would be considered better service, I don't know, uh, but also to say that it doesn't mean that you're ruling out the installation if you do it a different way. Uh, again, one and two family uh, rooftop installations. We're going to talk about string inverters. These are different ways that PV systems are built, DC converters, microinverters, um, and the like. Some overall limitations that we've put in place, um, and, and we've actually been working on kind of morphing those a little bit, is that we're dealing with snow loads no greater than 60 pounds per square foot. Having done quite a few trainings in Minnesota, I know that there is actually a a location in the far north of Minnesota where uh, many caribou live that uh, hits 70 pounds per square foot. And um, we are actually working on developing requirements for up to 80 pounds per square foot snow loading requirements. Uh, but as of, the, as of today, the, what we have here is designed for 60 pounds per square foot, which would be the vast majority of humans living in the state of Minnesota and in that entire region. Very few places in the United States are above 60 pounds per square foot, with the exception of some mountain, high mountaintop regions uh, throughout the United States, and we'll see some pictures of that. Um, wind loading requirements no greater than 150 miles per hour. That's not an issue in Minnesota, uh, and not an issue in most of the central part and western part of the United States. So if we look at kind of where, where these um, lines are. The red line you see there is the 150 mile per hour line, which is basically addresses the waterfront areas of the Gulf Coast, the southern third of, of uh, Florida, 
a tiny spot in South Carolina and Nantucket. Okay, so those are going to be areas that are above 150 miles per hour, and we've developed new guidelines actually for southern Florida and those regions um, that require some additional structural uh, attention. The blue line you see there is the 60 pounds per square foot line, which includes the majority of the upper peninsula of Michigan, which is not so far from you folks, um, but not a highly populated area. And uh, you can see that little tip of Minnesota um, that must have been somebody's land that, I don't know, there's gotta be history behind that little blip in Minnesota. Um, love to hear about it someday. And then of course we have Northern Vermont, uh, New Hampshire, Maine region where we can have some pretty high snow loads as well. There's also things called uh, case study areas. And so these case study areas are throughout the Rocky Mountains um, where we can have high snow loads as well as high wind loads throughout the west and even in parts of the Appalachian chain uh, through the northeast and even in western North Carolina, eastern Tennessee region. So let's go back and we're going to talk about two different ways to uh, to install PV systems. The, the, by far the most common and I would say 1.4 if not more, uh, 1.4 million of these 1.5 million installations in the United States are done with what we call mem member attached installations where we're actually li putting lag screws directly into the framing members of the roof. Uh, for a one and two family dwelling. All right, and again, it's that 60 pounds per square foot we were talking about, 150 miles per hour. Also a few extra stipulations, not exposure D. Exposure D is within 200 uh, yards of a waterfront location. So, and that waterfront needs to be a body of water that's more than two miles across. And so uh, I know there are many, many lakes in Minnesota, they talk about 10,000. I don't know whether that's true or not, but there's a lot of lakes in Minnesota, um, but not a lot that are of the scale that are that would actually implement exposure D. Clearly, the Great Lakes are an example of an exposure D location if you were on the waterfront of the Great Lakes, and some larger lakes and reservoirs can get into that range. Not on a steep hill. Now, Minnesota is not known for its steep hills, but a 5% grade could happen. And if somebody built a house on a steep, uh, on the top of a steep grade, that would be a special criteria as well. The next item is the roof mean height, no greater than 40 feet. When we say mean roof height, for those of you who are structural people, you would know exactly what this means. I apologize. There's probably a, most of you in the room that are not um, maybe uh, structural. Uh, folks in general, and so we're just going to do a little education here. Roof mean height um, would be the height, the average height of the roof. So typically the peak of the roof on a 40-foot roof mean height would be upwards of 45 feet or even higher. Uh, an extremely high residence. Uh, very few residences achieve that type of height. Um, mansions that are three stories can get close to that. Um, but it's, it's uncommon. Um, roof structure that meets the IRC. Um, so we're looking for the fact that either it's going to be a engineered truss system, which means that it has been engineered for the uh, location or, um, a rafter, um, span tables that, or rafters that meet the span tables in the IR international residential code. Lastly, and not least, uh, would be that there's no structural damage. So obviously, all the rules in the code are based upon uh, the assumption that the, the, the structure that we have there hasn't been altered by somebody cutting uh, to make room for storage in their attic or whatever, or that the roof, roof damage or water ingression that's caused rot of the roof or things like that. So those are things that are generally fairly easily observed by uh, looking in the attic um, where attic access is available, but those are some basic assumptions that we need to make clear. Okay, so let's look at this checklist and we're just gonna kind of briefly go through this checklist. Don't wanna spend a lot of time on any one item. Happy to come back to any of these items. 
and also happy to work with folks offline if there's additional questions. We have a 90-page um, uh, structural commentary that goes through each one of these items, does a lot of explanation, gives background, and it's really intended and written for the structural uh, specialists in a community that has lots and lots of questions because these, these uh, things that we're talking about are not widely known issues and therefore we would expect the structural specialists to have lots of good questions and so we've put together lots of what I think is good information for those structural specialists. So let's talk about these member attached systems. Uh, first of all, we're, we want the system set back from the edges of the roof by at least twice the gap under the module. Now, there may be larger gaps for fire access and things like that, but we're saying that's, that's going to be your minimum uh, gap to the edge. Now, uh, most PV systems have a gap of about five inches underneath them. So that means what we're saying is that we want a minimum of 10 inches back from the edge of the roof, and that's because of some high wind vortexes that happen there. This is something that's been discussed uh, or uh, discovered in the last decade or so and making its way into the structural world. Um, array doesn't, second item, array doesn't cantilever over the perimeter anchors more than 19 inches. This is all about snow load. This is all about not putting too much weight on our perimeter anchors and snow loading is the, is the primary concern here. And so what we're saying is that um, if, if we somehow need to cantilever more than 19 inches uh, to, for our, our last panel, that what we're going to do is extend our rail out and actually pick up the next rafter instead. Um, and that will provide better stability to the edge of the array. Uh, the next item is the gap under the module can be no more than 10 inches. As I mentioned, typical gaps are five inches. Anything more than about six or eight inches looks a little weird, quite frankly, um, and 10 inches would, would look very odd, but we set that as a maximum um, for the calculations that are uh, put together related to this ASCE7 document. Lastly, something that's been introduced to the code in the 2018 code is talking about gaps between modules. <clears throat> and uh, so there's a basic requirement for a gap of a quarter of an inch around the perimeter of every module. Uh, and that's essentially like a pressure release, if you will. Um, it could be done that way. And an alternative, which is equally good, maybe even a little better, would be to have a half inch on the long sides and if you wanted to butt, in, butt up together the short sides. So this is just a little bit about pressure relief in a PV array. Again, information that's been learned in the last decade uh, that improves the structural stability of PV systems on rooftops. Okay, um, next couple items have to do with uh, how the mounting rails are going on. So the mounting rail orientation, <coughs> um, or it could be a rail uh, installation. There are attachments or anchors where they don't even have a continuous rail, it might be a short rail or some type of an attachment that goes on that. In general, we run those perpendicular uh, as we look at it um, at the roof to the rafters. The rafters are typically going to go upslope, downslope um, in standard construction. And then our rails go perpendicular to those so we can pick up rafters whenever we, we are required to in order to distribute the load evenly across the roof. Number six is that the anchors that we're going to install are going to be perpendicular to the rafters or trusses and not exceed four feet between the anchors. And adjacent rows are actually going to be staggered. So what we're going to do is we're going to go, we're going to install, um, uh, let's say that we're going across the roof and trusses and we'll, we'll actually uh, look at some examples of this. We hit truss two, four, six, eight, ten in the first row. The next row is going to hit truss two, three, five, seven, nine, 11. And so we take alternate rafters. What that does is that spreads the load out evenly, allows us to go to very high snow loads. 60 pounds per square foot is extremely high. Um, and keep the loading of the roof even. And that's what we're all, that's what it's all about. <clears throat> this is assuming that our rafters and trusses are uh, no more than 24 inches apart. Okay. Um, also, the upslope downslope anchor spacing of the, of, for the rails is going to be based on the module manufacturer's instructions and not on um, 
the rail manufacturer's instructions, which is has to do with where the module gets supported is determines how much weight it can and handle. And that's why we use those guidelines. Uh, a typical, let's say a five foot tall solar panel, which would be typical of a residential rooftop. The rails are typically, the, the modules are typically installed more often than not, but not always, in a portrait manner, like a portrait piece of paper. And the rails typically are set about one foot in from each end. So there's a three foot gap in the middle and a one foot gap on each end uh, for the rails. And we'll see some examples of that as well later on. Uh, the anchor uh, fastener we're gonna use, the 5 16th lag screw with two and a half inch embedment. That's typically a four inch lag screw because we have about an inch and a half of material that we need to get to before we ever get to the rafter or truss. And so that's a, that is by far the most common method for attachment. And if that attachment is used, it meets the structural requirements of the code for fastening and for um, uplift requirements. And if uh, the attachment system uses something other than 5 16 flag screws like that, then uh, there need to be, would need to be some uh, engineering information supplied by the manufacturer that shows that they're at least as strong as the 5 16 flag screw, which we know is compliant. So some of the takeaways on, this, on that structural point are that uh, the houses that are built to compliance with the building code, so if we know they're built in compliance with the building code, meaning that they've been um, built by the approval of local, local uh, jurisdiction, uh, probably built in the last 40 to 50 years, uh, that they can support PV. Uh, houses that are consistent with that construction can also support PV. If the roof has a single layer of roofing, we also know that we have a fair amount of, of extra dead weight that the roof can actually handle that has been designed for, for multiple layers of roofing. And so that does help uh, uncomplicate some of the structural requirements for folks that have comp shingle uh, roofing. And then um, modules mounted to within two to 10 inches of the roof deck, that's the gap underneath them. Um, uh, will we'll do just fine. Uh, we're looking to keep them close to the roof like that. The array, we're looking for a distributed weight of four pounds per square foot. The fact is that most PV systems are well under three pounds per square foot. Very, very few that even get into the threes at all. There's some glass on glass modules that might get up to about three and a half pounds per square foot. But every product I'm aware of on the market today meets that about four pound per square foot number. Um, for typical uh, standoff mounts for rooftop systems. And that if the rafter spacing, the rafters are attached uh, at 48 inches uh, or closer uh, and the alternating trusses are attached to that we have a code compliant installation. So that's kind of a summary. We do have a set of options for low snow load and, no wind, and low wind. Uh, obviously that's, that would not include Minnesota uh, because even though you're uh, generally in a lower wind zone, uh, you're not in a low snow zone. So it's gonna be the southern part of the United States with the exception of the coastal Atlantic and Gulf regions. Uh, it would also include southern New Mexico, southern um, Arizona, and most of, the, of California at, at low elevation. So that's just, just to let you know that those things are there. The next couple of slides talk about these low snow load areas, which again, do not uh, relate to uh, your, your region. But I just wanted to let you know that those things uh, do exist. And if you have colleagues and friends in parts of the country that are, do have low snow load because you escape to their regions, maybe in the winter time, I don't know, might be an idea. Um, you can share those guidelines with those great folks there. Next item we're gonna talk about is sheathing attached limitations. So the two different methods are member attached, where we're actually attaching directly to the structural members. And then the other is sheathing attached, where we're actually attaching to the sheathing, which is attached to the structural members. And so we need to make sure that obviously we attach well to the sheathing, uh, and there's some stipulations on that. Uh, but we also, we also have some additional requirements when we just attach the sheathing uh, that we need to make sure are covered for areas of higher snow load and higher wind, or higher wind load, I should say, is really the big concern there. Um, 
because you're not in a high wind load area, it's actually uh, quite a bit easier. And um, sheathing attached again is not a very common method right now, but I do believe in the near future, sheathing attached will become probably the dominant method over the next decade. Um, there's a bunch of reasons for that. And one of the reasons is it's far easier to install. Um, member attached, one of, the, one of the challenges to member attached, and I think uh, most people that are familiar with construction could uh, attest to this. Uh, certainly the projects I've done with my friends and on my own house and other, other places, the most challenging part of the install is finding the center of the rafters in order to install the lag screw, uh, to drill the pilot hole correctly and install the lag screw. So um, knowing that that's a difficult task, we know that the level of skill that work in this, uh, in all of construction varies. Uh, let's just put it that way. And things that are easier for people to do right are going to be done right more often, if that makes any sense. And that's, the, that's my approach to everything, is that if I can make something easy for somebody to do the right thing, then the likelihood of them doing the right thing goes way up. We did this with grounding and bonding, and we'll talk about that when we get to the electro electrical section. Grounding and bonding is now quite easy to do, whereas it used to be one of the most difficult tasks to do right. Okay, with sheathing attached, we still have a 60 pound per square foot maximum. Again, works fine uh, in Minnesota, uh, for, for most of Minnesota. Wind loading, no greater than 140 miles per hour, well above uh, maximum wind speeds in Minnesota. Uh, again, no exposure D, no steep roofs, and then the roof mean height now we're bringing down to 30 feet rather than 40 feet. Again, 30 feet uh, means that the mean, the actual peak of the roof might be upwards of 35 feet or so. Um, and the vast majority of, of residences, I would say at least 95% of all residences, if not higher, um, meet that 30 foot mean roof height uh, requirement. Um, the roof structure meets the IRC, that's, that's another stipulation, and that we're going to be talking about in, in, installing on a roof that has a structure that's manufactured trusses, mean, meaning that it, by definition, has kiln-dry rafters, or if they're rafters, they have to be kiln-dried rafters. Um, this is something that's been newly discovered in the building code, and it's actually finding its way throughout the building code, um, that uh, green wood rafters actually can cause some problems with uh, adhering the deck to the roof. And so adhering the deck to the roof would have to be done with things like ring nails or screws or something like that if, um, if green wood is used for our rafters. Uh, again, this is something that's been discovered in the last five or 10 years, has very little to do with solar, but it does impact sheathing attached systems. Um, there are no structural damage, as we pointed out uh, previously. And then there's this new term, or it's going to be new to some people that are not familiar with structural um, issues, and that is tributary area. Tributary area matters. And what tributary area means is that when we put an anchor onto the sheathing on the deck, we're going to attribute a certain amount of the array or the modules to that anchor. It's the anchor's job to deal with half a module, let's say. So as long as it can hold down half a module, it's done its job. And so uh, that's what tributary area means. And it's really unnecessary to deal with tributary area when we're working with member attached systems because we have so many attachments um, and we have the rails that share load and things like that. So we don't get into that detail. So for sheathing attached systems, again, Minnesota looks great. Um, and in fact, we have areas, a uh, huge area of the country, <coughs> which would include Minnesota, that are below 120 miles per hour. So because it's below 120 miles per hour, we're going to see if so we got some benefits there. One of the interesting things, well, maybe interesting to some of you, is that <coughs> um, uh, when we're dealing with sheathing attached systems, we have to talk about where on the sheathing the, the, attach, the anchor actually is, is found. And I'm going to show you with my cursor here, um, a typical um, residential roof starts with four by eight sheets of sheathing, and they start at the eave, and they work their way up to the ridge. And they're installed in a landscape fashion, and they're typically staggered every other <coughs> row in order to 
um, bridge different rafters with uh, the edges of the sheathing. So this is standard construction. It's done this way virtually all the time. Um, and so we know that the first four feet of a typical roof is going to be um, a full sheet of sheathing. And then if we had any partial sheets, they're going to always happen right here at the ridge to make up the difference. And so we also know that if we install our anchors, say, um, two feet in from the edge of the roof, <clears throat> or right smack in the middle, we are in what we call the band of strength of that sheathing. Now, there's lots of explanation, and if you don't get it, don't, don't be worried about it. We've got lots of explanations that describe bands of strength. And it's the middle 16 inches going horizontally across the roof of a 4x8 sheet of sheathing. Okay? So these guys, these anchors, these little dots here are showing anchors. And those anchors are smack dab pretty close to the middle in the strongest part of the sheathing. This next group of anchors is also in the strongest part of the sheathing. But you can see that the next group of anchors is absolutely not in the strongest part of the sheathing. And engineering studies have been done and shown <clears throat> that, that the pullout strength uh, of the sheathing, not, that, not the anchor, but the sheathing itself, um, is twice as strong in the center than it is at the edge. Okay? So that's a nice little number. Double the strength in the middle as at the edge. If we need lots of strength, we need to care about where there were in bands of strength. If we don't need lots of strength, we can be fine wherever we go. And so we'll see some examples of both. <clears throat> Okay, so because uh, the state of Minnesota is below 120 miles per hour in its uh, maximum wind, then I like to go to the super simple and say, I don't care whether I'm in the bands of strength or not because I'm in an area where I never have a problem uh, with attachment. And so what this says is that if you stay more than three feet from the edge of the roof in all dimensions, that means that you're in wind zone one, meaning that the wind at 120 miles per hour is going to be uh, greatly reduced uh, because of our distance from the edge of the roof. And the tributary area that the anchor is holding down is nine square feet or less, which is about half the area of a typical solar panel, okay? And we'll see some examples of that in a minute. Um, and we're in wind exposure B, which is suburbia. Okay, suburban, urban, uh, suburban environments um, where there's trees, there's neighboring buildings and things like that are exposure B. Exposure C, which is also covered in these guidelines, would typically be a farmhouse in the middle of an open field with no trees around it. All right. That does happen routinely in Minnesota, but um, uh, that would graduate you to the next level up in this um, sheathing attached system. But if you, if you meet these basic guidelines, then um, it doesn't matter where you put the anchors, you're going to be good if you stay within those basic guidelines. <clears throat> now, if your anchors are in bands of strain, then it allows you a little bit more tributary area um, and a little, a little higher wind speed and allows you to go to exposure B. So that would allow you to get into that uh, higher wind load area. Okay. Uh, now, going back, I'll just flip back a couple of slides here. And um, going back to this little diagram here, um, now these these panels are in the clo are closer than three feet from the edge of the roof, and so by being in bands of strength, they meet that basic requirement. The rest of the array is more than three feet from the edge of the roof, and it doesn't need to. We don't have to worry about it being in bands of strength, and that's really what we want to uh, be concerned with. If we really need the space to get to within closer than three feet of the bottom eave of the roof then make sure that your first anchors are about two feet from the edge of the roof and you're in the bands of strength. If you don't, if you don't need that extra room, then just keep the array within three feet, uh, more than three feet from the edge of the roof and you're good to go. Or at ASC 7, uh, it's 10% of um, the shortest dimension of the building. So if the building has a dimension of um, 
of 40 feet, then it would be four, uh, the shortest dimension is 40 feet, then it would be four feet. That's a really big dimension for a house, uh, for the shortest dimension. Uh, a ranch style house would typically be on the order of 25 to 30 feet. Uh, from front to back, and so then the requirements are uh, three feet, no less than three feet. Okay, so that's a little bit about ASC 7, more than most people would care to learn. And then the last item here is that the anchor to sheathing connection, that's how it attaches to that decking, um, has a design stress of 166 pounds, which means that it's been tested to an ultimate uplift of three times that, or 520 pounds. And so that would be have to come with the documentation for a sheathing attached system. And then there's this overarching general statement for both of these structural checklists, which is that if any structural item can't be checked off, then the building official can certainly require the installer to provide structural calculations or details stamped by a signed design professional addressing the unchecked item or if it's not just one or two items, they say, hey, this is going completely off book because it's not standard um, two foot on center construction. It's, uh, let's say, post and beam construction. Then we're going to have a sign. Uh, then the, the structural calcs are going to be done by a design professional in anyway. All right, let's move on to electrical. We'll cover that quickly and then open it up for questions. <clears throat> Okay, the electrical part, I'm, I'm happy to say, has gotten a lot simpler over the years, and hopefully I've had something to do with that. Um, in working with the National Electrical Code, I've been on the code panel uh, for uh, about 10 years now, exactly 10 years now, and um, have been heavily involved in most all of the committees that are related to solar photovoltaic systems on the electrical code, uh, intimately involved in that whole process and has been intimately involved in actually updating the code and revising the code and simplifying the code so that it's easier to um, enforce in the field. And so item, the first item is that the, elect, the main electrical components like the PV modules, most people call them panels, uh, DC converters, inverters, are identified for use in PV systems. So we have tons and tons of equipment on the market today that has been certified by UL, Intertech, uh, CSA. Um, those are the three main organizations that do certifications on solar equipment. And so we have tons of equipment available. Now, there's a thing called the internet, and we're using that right now to communicate. And one of the good and bad things about the internet is that it provides you access to all products anywhere, everywhere. And unfortunately, there are products out there solar panels and inverters and the like that are not certified. And they're not listed to the proper um, listings and certifications and safety standards. And those are absolutely off the list. Um, there is no financial benefit, by the way, to buying those products because we have fully certified products that are of the same price or probably even cheaper than many of the products that are coming in from all over the world that do not have proper certification. So there is no tolerance whatsoever for products that are not properly listed to the standards that we worked for decades to put in place. One of the standards at item two is a fairly new standard called UL 2703, and that's a certification for mounting systems. That certification covers a variety of things related to mounting systems, and one of the main things that it was intended for uh, first of all, was to certify the bonding and grounding aspects of a mounting system. So most all of our mounting systems for residential rooftop applications are made of aluminum, okay? And so it takes special fittings and clips and things like that in order to bond electrically those metal parts together and then bond the modules to those metal parts and that whole process gets certified to UL 2703. Um, by doing that, it makes it super simple for the installer to assemble the system and essentially attach one ground lug to an entire group of modules and have it completely safely grounded properly. And um, because that's uh, easy to do, uh, it just takes selection of products, we make this a mandatory for the simplified permitting process. It's one of the examples. And if somebody doesn't like that, that's fine. We have the normal construction process, but it is an important 
uh, easy step for the installer and helps uh, everyone involved with a with a part of the installation that historically has been problematic, quite frankly. Um, next item, uh, number three, is that the array consists of no more than two strings per inverter input. Many inverters have two, possibly three inputs, and so we're gonna say no more than four series strings total per inverter, and that has to do with the, the size of the conduit and the, the number of conductors in conduit and all the calculations we've put into play in this to simplify the installation process. Okay, um, since we're now on the 2017 code, National Electrical Code in Minnesota, um, we can look at uh, some, also some of the savings on the electrical wiring. So what we're gonna say is that the wiring, all of our exposed circuit wiring is no smaller than 12 gauge PV wire or a manufactured cable that's been listed with the equipment. Now, PV wire comes with every PV module and it is readily available. It's what we use for exposed cables in a PV array. And we're gonna say no smaller than 12 gauge. A lot of folks use 10 gauge, which is one step larger. But 12 gauge would be sufficient based on the new rules in the 2017 code. All uh, PV source, Circuit wiring and raceway is no smaller than 12 gauge as well. So that once we put it in conduit, it's no smaller than 12 gauge, but it's also can be THWN-2, XHHW-2, or RHW-2. For electrical people, you know what those things mean. It's 90 degrees C wet rated cables that are designed to go in conduit, designed to go in homes, have fire, proper fire ratings and the like. If you don't know anything about electrical, it's just a bunch of letters and numbers. Sorry about that. Any field installed PV output circuit wiring, if we had a combiner, which we rarely do nowadays, in fact, I'm not aware of any residential inverters on the market that have combiners built into them, um, but if it did, and we had to install uh, output circuit wiring that wasn't included in the equipment, then we're gonna say a minimum number six just to make it simple, which is a larger conductor. Lastly, the PV system circuits on buildings have to meet the requirements for controlled conductors in 690.12. 690.12 is the section talking about rapid shutdown. Rapid shutdown is a process that was established in the 2014 code and greatly detailed in the 2017 code, which talks about how we have to um, install our arrays on buildings in order to uh, reduce the hazard to firefighters uh, for conductors outside the array and the conductors inside the array now in the 2017 code. Uh, we'll talk about that briefly, and we just don't have time to go into it in detail today because uh, there's a lot to that whole requirement. The last item here is the total inverter capacity of a, has a continuous AC output of 15 kilowatts or less. That has to do with the size, the largest size inverter or set of in, a pair of inverters that you could put on an 80 amp circuit breaker going into a 400 amp service. If the service were half that size, a 200 amp service, which is by far the most common uh, residential service in the United States, then the number would be exactly half that, or about 7,700 watts. <clears throat> All right, and then we have load side connections and supply side connections, and we have rules for each one of those types of connections. As I mentioned at the beginning of the training, because it gets cold in Minneapolis and Minnesota, the re that region, uh, we have to care about the coldest temperatures and making sure that the uh, temperature of uh, the outside temperature doesn't cause the voltage of the system to rise too high for the equipment that we're connecting it to. So we have <clears throat> this uh, solar permitting guidelines. Uh, well, actually, it's the old school solarabcs.org forward slash permitting has a website, and I'll show you that website here. I'm looking to my right because I have this information here for us. I'm gonna bring it over to show you on the screen, and we're gonna see that downtown St. Paul, um, be the closest to the Maplewood area, um, has an extreme minimum temperature of minus 28 degrees. That's a design temperature. That's the average minimum on record is minus 28. That doesn't mean that's the coldest it's ever gotten. That's just the average minimum. And the code recommends using that average minimum, which is extremely cold, as the criteria for determining the voltage of the PV module. Now, 
It also says that we got to go to table 690.7 in order to determine what is the actual um, uh, factor that we need to use for that uh, correction factor. And let me show you that. And we see here, here's the correction factor table. And you can see we said it was minus 28. So that, that means our correction factor is 1.21. All right. And that, um, we use that 1.21 factor and that's how we increase the rated open circuit voltage value for calculations uh, for the code. All right, we're almost done here. So we're gonna show you a couple examples. And so, um, We'll, we'll go ahead and uh, talk about DC converters, microinverters, and things like that, and a couple examples. And this goes through making sure that our inverters and our converters can handle the voltage that we're gonna put uh, to them. And this is a fill out, a little fill in sheet that makes sure that we're not gonna exceed the maximum input voltage. A lot of inverters that go for residences have a 600 volt, um, maximum voltage and we're going to have to comply with that and we'll see some examples. Next and lastly in the electrical that we're going to use a standard electrical diagram and we've got four electrical diagrams that we're going to use for this, maybe five. We might have added one um, that meet these requirements and that if there's something that's more complex about the system and these diagrams don't work, then you go through the standard construction process. <clears throat> okay, so let's let's do an example of a string inverter um, using the standard plans, um, and uh, we'll, we'll go through an example. We have a seven and a half kilowatt system. It's a very common size system, probably the most common size uh, in the United States. And uh, using 30, 285 watt modules going into an American inverter. Um, this, these are all fictitious no names. Um, 7,500 watt inverter. It's a sheathing attached system, and the house was built. In 1988, it's got a very low pitch roof for, for your region, uh, but it's structurally compliant. All right, let's uh, go ahead and fill out the documentation. Here, that should look kind of familiar to you. That was the, the example we gave you in the sheathing attached system. There's a bunch of information over here that talks about the mean roof height and, and things like that. And we also see where the attachments are. We see where we have a junction box we bring that electrical down to the inverter with the combiner. Um, if it has a com or a DC disconnect, it's on the outside of the building and then goes into a panel on the outside of the building or in the garage possibly. Um, and that just shows you where everything is on the roof. The next item uh, is going to be, is the electrical diagram. And this is a fill-in diagram, in fact, uh, just to give you an idea of what this kind of looked like to start with, um, we have a we have a standard electrical diagram where you can just fill it out. It's a, P, a fillable PDF, and um, and you can build basically build this diagram without having to have special software or anything like that. We also provide all this information in uh, Visio so that a jurisdiction or a contractor could take that and, uh, and adapt it as necessary. So here's all the information about the modules, the converter, it, well this doesn't have converters, but it does have a, um, a rapid shutdown box and things like that. Now because we're in the 2017 code, uh, this particular installation may not be code compliant and we would have to go to one of the reasons we talk about uh, DC converters, we're probably gonna go to a DC converter installation and we're gonna talk about say a solar edge DC optimizer or whatever the manufacturer is. Uh, Tygo and solar edge are the two most common. And then that's gonna be able to shut the panels off at the array. This has all the information about the size of the conductors down here and the location and all that. The next slide is, is the notes page that goes along with that, which gives us details on the module, gives us detail on the inverter, gives us detail on the voltage. This is this happened. This example happens to be based on minus 12 degrees C. We would change that to minus 28 degrees C, and then what that's going to change is that's going to change the maximum system voltage up here. Instead of being 461, it's going to be probably around uh, closer to 500 volts. Um, this equipment's rated for 600 volts, so that's not a problem. Continuing on, let's talk about the microinverter example. Similar uh, criteria. 
and we're going to use the exact same number of modules. This is compliant with the 2017 code as written today. Uh, similar type house, although in this particular case, this is a um, uh, hip roof installation with um, with our uh, microinverters, and so we're going to have a couple of four microinverters facing east, four facing west, and the vast majority on the south. And we're going to split those into two circuits of 15 microinverters each. And so that's all going to be done in the electrical here, and then bring that down to a subpanel and a disconnect that it, which goes into uh, the main panel. And this is what it looks like electrically. Again, this started out looking like something like, uh, let's see here, like this. Yep. Let's bring this over. It started out looking something like this. We fill in the information and we're good to go. All right, so that's just to give you an example. There's also the notes page is exactly the same notes page, except we don't have anything on the DC disconnect because we don't have separate uh, DC switches on these systems. We use the connectors as the switch. And there's a little note here, the little asterisk that says, if you're using microinverters or AC modules, you don't have to have the DC disconnect, dis disconnect sign on each uh, microinverter. This gives us a little bit about the microinverter and uh, those temperature issues and things like that. Okay, so that's, um, that's the time that I have to do the basic presentation. I think now we're gonna open it up for questions and comments before we take a break um, and do our, um, our little uh, forum. So any questions? Bill, we have you. Uh, we have you till about three, yeah. I believe so. Excellent. Okay. So, um, just brief questions right now. After we take our break, come back for about a twenty-five minute period for more involved Q and A. Um, but yeah, I uh, figured right now we could, since we just came out of really technical portion of this um, training, uh, if there were really technical related questions we have right now. And as we go through the longer, larger Q&A, take that up to a larger process Q&A. Yeah, and as you think of things, we can also address them certainly in the larger Q&A session as well. But if there's something that somebody's itching to ask uh, before we take our break, um, fire away. Yes, please. Hi, Bill. My name is Adi Dojo Gino. I'm a fan of Minneapolis. You know, the usual permits for everything you've been explaining. Is that applicable to, you know, flush months, areas, or because I know at times we have other one other than the flush months in for the pilot. So just to clarify, in case you couldn't hear, Bill, and for folks in mind, uh, did everything we just go through pr primarily apply to flush mounted? Because uh, city of Minneapolis do get some applications where they aren't necessarily flush mounted. Is that accurate? Correct. We're saying that the panels have to stay within 10 inches of the roof. So if there is any angle to them, there's a very little, small angle to them. Um, and the only reason you would put panels at an angle would be if you were possibly on a flat roof installation. Um, there are one and two family homes with flat roofs. Um, and generally we wanna keep the panels pretty flat when we're on a flat roof. So in general, uh, the term flush mount is a term that's been there for a little while that uh, basically is referring to above and parallel to the roof surface. That's the vast majority of installations and we're not providing structural information for anything other than those types of installations where the gap under the module is under 10 inches. If you start putting panels at a steeper pitch, uh, you are going to have to do some engineering and you are going to have to address things like um, snow fencing effects where you're actually going to cause snow to pile on a roof that would not normally do that. Anyone else here before we break? Okay. 
Well, thank you, Bill, for that presentation. Everyone's definitely itching for a little break here. Um, so we'll see everyone back here at, I believe we're slated for, we'll push it at 2.30, I believe. Yeah, 2.30 in seven minutes. And give one thing. What's that? We can go to 35. 2.35? Yeah, that sounds better to me as well. All right, great. So everyone see you back at 2.35.